believe that's why we're here tonight. We're expressing our trust in Him, building lives, building families, building His kingdom. Every time we come together, I believe that there's virtue that's added into our lives. There is strength that we gain when we come together. We are better together. We are stronger together. And I'm thankful for that tonight, that we can be together and worship together. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's just really good to be in church tonight. Why don't you just turn around to somebody close to you, and while you're maintaining your distance, just pull your mask down a little bit and just give them a big smile, all right? Just, there you go, there you go. That looks so good. Your smiles look so good. So good to see you all in the house of the Lord tonight. To all those that are joining us online, we welcome you to Christian Life Center. So thankful for the goodness of God, His blessings in our lives, and the privilege that we have to be part of such a wonderful community of faith, such a wonderful church family and CLC truly is a family and I thank God for that whether you've been here 40 50 60 70 years or just a few days or weeks or a few months you are part of the family and you're such an important part of this family and we thank God for each of you your faithfulness your commitment your sacrifice your decision to live out your faith every day, to express that faith through the decisions that you make in spite of what's going on around us, in spite of what's happening in our culture, in spite of what is happening socially or politically or even spiritually, the dynamics that are so unique right now. I just want to commend you, CLC, for standing firm on that foundation and living for God every day making up your mind, making the decision. You're here tonight because you made a decision. I'm going to live for God today. I'm going to go to church tonight. I'm sure there were a lot of obstacles. There were some opportunities. You could have said, ah, I'm not feeling well. I, you know what? I've got this going on. This is happening. I've got a lot going on tomorrow. I need to get ready. To just, there are always so many excuses and opportunities that we could take to either not come to church or not view online but you made that decision tonight wherever you are or so many opportunities every day to just not live for God live for ourselves live for the flesh give in to temptations we face but you're making decisions every day I'm gonna live for God doesn't mean you're perfect you're not here tonight because you're perfect I'm not here tonight because I'm perfect I'm here tonight because I serve a perfect God who is a good God a merciful God a great God and he's here tonight and I'm thankful for that. You can be seated. We are in a season of revival. And I, I believe that it's the will of God for us to cultivate this season of revival until it becomes just a culture of revival. I believe that would be the will of God for us, for our families, for our church family, to just cultivate this culture of revival it, it is a culture of expectation we're in the middle of our 21 days of focused prayer and fasting just in the final days of that and i want to express my appreciation to you for fasting making that commitment praying taking some extra time to pray and seek the face of god we have these special services coming up here in the next uh, week and a half and i have great expectation for what god is going to do. It is so critical that we understand our personal responsibility when it comes to the kingdom of God. That every single individual here tonight has a personal responsibility. That you have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. And the purpose of the church is not just to be a, a gathering place and a club and uh, just to maybe punch that ticket to heaven and hope 
that we make it. That, that's not what this is all about. God has a purpose for you to make a difference in somebody's life, to do something, to say something, to be something that helps somebody else experience truth and discover their place of purpose in the kingdom of God. God wants to use you. And I believe that God is calling to us. He's speaking to us, especially in this time of focused prayer and fasting. This is about positioning ourselves where we can hear from God and we can discern his voice and discern his will and his purpose for our lives. So tonight we're continuing this short two-part series. This is revival. Everybody say, this is revival. This is revival. Our responsibility in God's response. Our key text is 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, this uh, declaration from the Lord. Solomon has prayed his prayer of dedication for the temple and the Lord is responding with this conditional promise if, everybody say if, yeah. if you do this, then say then, yeah. then God is giving us this promise. He's going to respond to what we do and how we are obedient and express our faith through obedience. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. This beautiful, concise, powerful picture of true revival, our responsibility in God's response. So last week we covered that portion of this verse that is our responsibility to humble ourselves and to pray and to seek the face of God, to turn from our wicked ways. That that does not produce revival. That is revival. When the church is humbling themselves and praying and seeking the face of God and repenting, that is revival. That is powerful when we are dying to ourselves, dying to our own will and agenda and submitting ourselves to the will and the purpose of God. That is revival. Humility, the first step toward repentance and true spiritual transformation. Prayer is just nothing, nothing complicated. It's simply developing a relationship with God. Seeking his face is about seeking his presence, his direction, his purpose, and turning from our wicked ways. That is simply repentance. The act of turning away from the direction we have been heading and turning toward God. That's a place of transformation in our lives. So let's talk about God's response, this conditional promise that he has given us. If my people will do this, then I will hear and forgive and heal. Let's talk about this God who hears. God's ability to hear the cries and the prayer of his people is one of the many distinguishing characteristics that scripture mentions to declare the difference between the one true living God and the false gods of this world. We serve a God who hears us. Psalm 115 says, their idols, the world's gods, their idols are merely things of silver and gold shaped by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, and eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, and noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, and feet but cannot walk, and throats but cannot make a sound. And those who make idols are just like them, as are all who trust in them. Those are the gods of the world. But our God hears us when we pray. I don't want to take that for granted, that God hears us when we pray. Elijah would mock the 450 prophets of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18 because their God could not hear them. He would not respond to their sacrifice. They were doing everything they could. They even were cutting themselves and trying anything they could to get some kind of response from their God. But he would not respond. He could not respond because he could not hear them. But our God is not like their God. Our God hears us when we pray. Proverbs 15, 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Psalm 34, verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he heard me. And delivered me from all my fears. Is there anybody that has that testimony? There have been so many times where I went to the Lord and I cried out to him. And I'm thankful that he heard me and he delivered me. He heard me and he responded. He heard me and he saved me. He heard me and he healed me. A few verses later in 
Verses 15 through 17 of Psalm 34. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He will erase their memory from the earth. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. I'm thankful to know we have a God who hears us. Isaiah 65, 24, before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The NLT says it this way. I will answer them before they even call to me. He knows when you're about to call. He knows our needs before we ask. He wants us to ask. He said, ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door shall be open. He wants us to ask and seek and knock. But before we even start asking, he's already working and preparing the answer for us. I'll answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. Have you ever been praying about something and you're trying to get through to God and convince him how badly you need something and he's tapping you on the shoulder? If you'll stop talking long enough, I'll let you know I've already taken care of it. If you'll just shut up a little bit and let me talk to you, I've, I'm already working. Before you even started praying, I was already preparing. I was already getting the answer ready. I was already working on your behalf. If you'll just go ahead and pause a little bit and praise me for it, I'm already doing it. He said, I will answer them before they even call. While they're still talking about their needs, I'll go ahead and answer their prayers. What a promise. What a promise. First John chapter 5 says this. We're confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. Now, if it doesn't please him, don't expect him to answer. But we're confident that we're praying, that when we are praying prayers according to his will and his purpose, that he hears us when we ask for those things that please him. And since we know he hears us, when we make those kind of requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. Those are some strong, confident words. John said, we're confident. He hears us when we're praying according to his will and his purpose. And since we know that he hears us, he, he's not just listening, but he's going to do something about it. He will give us what we ask for. We have been praying we have been fasting. We have been seeking his face. And I'm confident that somebody has been praying some kingdom prayers. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. And when we're praying according to the will of God, we can be confident. Not only will he hear us, but he's going to give us what we're asking for. We're praying for souls. We're praying for breakthrough. We're praying that we can make a difference in our community. That God will give us opportunities to witness to somebody. I'm confident that those are prayers that please God and when we pray those kind of prayers he is going to give us what we're asking for I want to encourage somebody you've been praying for that family member you've been praying for that friend that neighbor that co-worker I'm claiming it in Jesus name I believe those are prayers that please the heart of God he hears you and he's going to give us what we're asking for Jesus name Isaiah gives us both a promise and a word of warning. In Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Listen, he said, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear you call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. It's a promise, but it's also a word of of warning God has not ever ever abandoned us there's times we have walked away there's times we have distanced ourselves. but it is not God who has forsaken us because his arm isn't too weak to save us his ear is not too deaf to hear us call if there is a reason if there's something that stands as an obstacle between us and God hearing and answering our prayer, it is because there's sin in us that we need to deal with. But when we deal with that sin, when we deal with our own rebellion, when we deal with this flesh 
and we surrender it to God, we can be confident he will hear and he will answer and he will respond to the prayer of his people. God hears, but sin separates him. That's why we have to deal with the sin. We can be confident that God will hear our prayer. Confidence in God hearing our prayer is inversely proportional to the condemnation that we deal with in our heart. Now, if we have dealt with sin and we've asked God to forgive us, then that condemnation is simply just a tool of the enemy. If the condemnation that we're dealing with is because of sin, we need to repent of that sin and take the tool and the weapon out of the enemy's hand. Because then he has nothing to bring condemnation against us with. He, when we've dealt with the sin, then we can look at the enemy and say, Hey, get thee behind me, Satan. I've repented of that sin. It's under the blood. You can't use that against me. And when we've dealt with that sin and we've dealt with that condemnation, and when condemnation is low, confidence is high that God is going to hear my prayer and respond to my cry. God hears, but sin separates. This is a perfect segue into our next area of focus as God responds to his people because not only does he hear, but he also forgives and he heals. Several weeks ago, I preached a message I titled Vi Victus from this Latin phrase, woe to the vanquished. Jesus declared, I have overcome the world. And in that message, we talked about sin and sickness, that Jesus Christ has conquered death, hell, and the grave. He has won the victory for us. And we see this correlation again in this verse, Second Chronicles 7, 14. God declares this promise. I will forgive your sin and I will heal your land. Forgiveness and healing. He deals with sin and sickness. The forgiving of sin is one of the most God-defining abilities that he has. To forgive sin is divine. The biblical definition of sin is to miss the mark. That's just the most literal translation of the word sin. To miss the mark. God has defined a target for us, his word. And to sin is to rebel against that word and the will of God and to miss the mark that he has designed and destined for us. Romans 3.23 says everyone has sinned. We have fallen short of God's glorious standard, or we have missed the mark that he has destined for us. And there's a penalty for sin. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. There's a price to be paid for sin, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. There is a penalty to be paid for sin, but I am so thankful that a price was paid at Calvary that takes care of that judgment and that penalty of sin. Not only does the blood of Jesus wash away our sin, but he takes care of the penalty and the judgment that was against us because of that sin. One of, one of the most powerful passages of Scripture talking about sin is found in Romans chapter 5, and we see a contrast that is made between Adam and Christ, Christ being the second Adam, and it's, it's spoken of within this context of sin. One brought sin, introduced sin, but the other conquered sin. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, when, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not obey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did or who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. But there's a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift, this gift of repentance, this gift of forgiveness, leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, 
caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who will receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Adam's sin introduced sin. His rebellion introduced sin, but Christ has conquered sin. And through this gift of forgiveness, our sins are washed away and the penalty of our sins is removed. I am thankful for the gift of forgiveness. We talk a lot about the gift of the Holy Ghost, but I am thankful for the gift of forgiveness, that our sins have been washed away. That penalty, that judgment of sin has been taken away through the blood of Jesus Christ. John would say, 1 John chapter 1, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, if we're just honest and transparent, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is not looking for perfection. He is looking for honesty. He is looking for transparency. He is looking for somebody who will say, I don't have it all together. I need you, God. I have failed. I have fallen. I have messed up. I'm not enough. Seems to be a common theme here lately. God, I'm not enough. I need you. And God said, if you'll be that honest and and that transparent, I will forgive you of your sins. He is righteous and, and he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins when we're honest and transparent about those sins. If we confess, he will forgive. Repentance and baptism in Jesus' name. Give us access to the gift of forgiveness. It's what Peter declared on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.38. Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you. Every one of you. I love that phrase. It's both a challenge and it's also a blessing because the challenge is this, that everyone must be baptized in Jesus' name. But the beautiful promise and blessing in this is that everyone can be baptized in Jesus' name. You, you don't have to qualify for it. You don't have to have a certain social standing or a certain amount of money. or You don't have to, to clean yourself up and be living a certain lifestyle in order to be baptized in Jesus' name. No, everybody can be baptized in Jesus' name. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, Christ for the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Everybody must and everybody can. The gift of forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Ghost are available for every person in this room tonight. The gift of forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Ghost is available for every person who is watching this service tonight. It is available for you. I'm thankful that I serve a God who hears and forgives our sins. The final response from God in this conditional promise is healing. God said, I will heal your land. I I believe what he was talking about there is he talks about healing our land. I think this is as broad a description of healing as you could give. I'll heal your land. That there's not a wound in the entire land that cannot be healed by my touch. Whether it's an individual need, a family need, a church need, a a nation that needs healing, whatever it is. He said, I will heal your land. God is a healer. Is there anybody tonight that you can testify? Just maybe wave a hand right now and say, God is a healer. That he's healed my body. He's healed my mind. He's healed my heart. Look at the hands across this sanctuary tonight who are testifying that God is a healer. I can testify multiple times in my life where God has healed me physically. He has healed me spiritually and emotionally. God is a healer. He is the healer of hearts and and minds and bodies. He's the healer of spiritual needs, mental needs, emotional needs, physical wounds. He is a healer. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, God declares, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, and you will go free, leaping with joy like calves let out to pasture. 
Those who fear my name, the son of righteousness is going to rise with healing in his wings. We know this is a, a prophecy of the Messiah who would come bringing healing, that son of righteousness who would come with healing. I'm thankful to know tonight that we have a Savior who is a healer. He hears, he forgives, and he heals. Luke chapter number 4, Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. This is just one of those amazing settings in Scripture. Something that no doubt they had read so many times in the synagogue and talked about that day that Messiah would come. And Jesus stands on this particular day and reads the scripture. He hands the scroll, the scripture to the minister. And he says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. This day day the scripture that you have been reading for hundreds of years that messiah that you've been desiring for hundreds of years is here right now today this day is this scripture fulfilled i am declaring for somebody tonight that there is forgiveness of sins and there is healing for your heart your mind your body for you tonight i'm declaring that this day this scripture is going to be fulfilled for somebody who can have that condemnation and guilt washed away that maybe you came with pain but you can leave this service tonight without pain because we serve a God who hears and he forgives and he heals them could we just take a moment right now and thank the Lord for that would you give him praise right now hallelujah Lord you hear the prayer of your people Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. He has come to heal. That's exactly what Jesus did throughout the Gospels. Matthew 4, 23. It says, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. A few chapters later, chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. There's not a sickness. There's not a disease. There's not a sin. There's not a failure that he can't take care of tonight. There is nothing that is beyond his ability. There is nothing he cannot do. There is no sin so great he can't forgive it that his blood can't cover it and wash it away. There is no sickness, no disease, no cancer. There is nothing too difficult for our God. He is able. He went throughout the cities and the villages declaring the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and, and every disease among the people. I want that kind of an experience here at Christian Life Center. I want to see that kind of demonstration of the Holy Ghost where we leave services and we say every single disease was healed. Every single sickness was healed. Every single sinner was delivered. Every heart was touched. Every mind was touched. Every family was ministered to. Every marriage was touched. Uh, every individual received exactly what they needed. Uh, is there anybody that wants to see that? Uh, to experience that kind of demonstration uh, of God's power? If my people who are called by my name uh, will humble themselves uh, and pray uh, and seek my face uh, and turn from their wicked ways, then God said, uh, I'm going to hear your prayer. I'm going to forgive your sin uh, and I will heal your land. Sin and sickness, it's no match for the power of God. Jesus declared to that lame man in Mark 2, your sins are forgiven you. But Jesus, he's lame. He needs healing. Well, I think Jesus was communicating some priorities there. First of all, he needs his sins taken care of. Because it would be better to enter into heaven lame than to be cast into outer darkness and be whole in your body. He said, your sins are forgiven you. We're going to take care of first things first. This is the priority. You've got to make sure your heart's right. But it's just as easy for me to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. 
And so the lame man left that day with more than just his healing, more than just a physical touch. But he left being made whole in his spirit because his sins were forgiven. It's just as easy tonight for Jesus to forgive somebody's sin as it is for him to heal your body. There's nothing too difficult for him. The psalmist said, let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He forgives all my sins and he heals all my diseases. What a promise and what an opportunity. If my people, then I will. I will. We have humbled ourselves. We've been praying. We have been fasting. We have been seeking the face of God. We've been repenting. And I am confident tonight that God has been hearing and that he is forgiving and that he is healing. I want you to stand with me tonight. He is the wounded healer. He is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. He was tempted in all points, just exactly as we are, yet without sin, so that we can come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. The prophet Isaiah would declare this messianic prophecy concerning our Savior in Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. This verse communicates perhaps the greatest injustice in the history of mankind. The perfect, sinless Lamb of God was pierced because of our rebellion. The perfect one, the sinless one, was crushed because we sinned. He was beaten so that our brokenness could be made whole. He was whipped so that my wound could be healed. Such incredible injustice. Yet, when we understand that the one who endured the beating and the crushing and the piercing and that whip upon his back had the power over the sin that had conquered us and power over the death that was the penalty of that sin. He could become sin for you and I. Though he had committed no sin, he could become sin to set us free from sin. He could become sin and he could take that piercing and that crushing and that beating and that whip so that you and I could be forgiven of our sins and could be healed, emotional healing and spiritual healing and physical healing. Peter would quote the prophet in 1 Peter chapter 2 and say, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. By his wounds, you are healed. By his wounds, you are healed. The one who hears and the one who forgives and the one who heals is in this house tonight. There, however, is some responsibility that rests upon you and I because he cannot hear a prayer that is never prayed. 
He cannot answer a cry that never goes forth. He is waiting right now. I believe he's waiting and he's looking and he's wondering, is somebody going to call on me? I want to forgive and I want to heal. I wonder if somebody is going to cry out to me. I wonder if somebody's going to call out to me tonight. All you have to do is call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not our calling that saves us. It's not our voice that brings healing. It is the one that we're calling upon. It's the one that we're praying to. It's the one that we're crying out to. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. You need to quiet down, Bartimaeus. Jesus doesn't have time for you. He doesn't have time to stop. No, I'm going to cry out because I believe we serve a God who hears and forgives and he heals. Jesus. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. The psalmist prayed this prayer. Oh God, listen to my cry and hear my prayer. From the ends of the earth, I cry to you for help. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the towering rock of safety. For you are my safe refuge, a fortress where my enemies can't reach me. Let me live forever in your sanctuary, safe beneath the shelter of your wings. Oh God, hear my cry. Oh God, hear my prayer. Somebody open your mouth right now and lift your voice and let out a cry. There's a God who is ready and he's waiting and he's listening to hear the cry of his people. If my people will pray, if my people will seek me, if my people will repent, I'm listening and I'm ready to forgive and I'm ready to heal.